Tamam. Uh, Doktor Deniz Tüpençin received his uh, master and PhD degrees in atomic physics from 19 Mayıs Üniversitesi in uh, 2007 and 2013 respectively. Using a national grant, he spent a year as a visiting researcher at Dortmund yes. Technical University. Uh, he was a researcher uh, at Koch University from 2014 to 2016, and he took part in an international project. From 2017 to 2018, he had a postdoctoral research position in the Cognitive Systems Laboratory of the Electrical Engineering Department at Istanbul Technical University. Currently, he is a faculty member in the Department of Electric Engine Electrical Engineering at Istanbul Technical University. His primary research interests are uh, quantum optics, uh, quantum computation, and open quantum systems. So. Uh, I leave the floor to Dr. Tukpanche. Uh, okay, thank you for this nice introduction. Um, in this welcome all. In this presentation, I will uh, try to make a concise introduction to the mathematics of quantum computation. Uh, I would like to share my screen and start the lecture, if possible. Yes. Okay. First, I would like to start from the definitions of quantum computing and why we are interested in this. Uh, what is quantum computing? Is, in fact, quantum computing is a new way of computing that uses the principles of quantum mechanics. Okay, so here the goal is to solve problems that are believed to be impossible with classical computers by exploiting the unique properties of quantum mechanics, okay? So these properties are, one of them are quantum superposition, and the other is uh, one step farther of quantum superposition, quantum entanglement, which is known as uh, the uh, bipartite uh, or multipartite <clears throat> A version of superposition with inseparable states. So here, <clears throat> in classic, we have two ways. <laughs> we can go zero or one. But uh, in quantum mechanics, by means of quantum interference, we have the option to go in both ways. So if we can translate this unique property into algorithmic processes, would it be beneficial for uh, developing uh, more advanced uh, quantum algorithms or not. So this is the unique uh, problem of quantum computation. Before starting the uh, mathematics of quantum computation, first let's review uh, some uh, physical platforms of uh, quantum computers. So today, uh, some uh, countries or uh, companies are trying to build uh, a quantum computer. So these quantum computers are based on some physical platforms, which are known as superconducting circuits, trapped ions, neutral atoms, quantum dots, photonic hardware, and so on. So first of all, the most popular uh, quantum computing platform is based on superconducting circuits. So they are most common type of computing hardware and they use superconducting circuits to create qubits, which are the basic units of quantum information. We know them as transform qubits, um, different type of uh, uh, superconducting qubits, and we have more in fact. The next one is, uh, the next platform is trapped ions. So they use, in fact, individual atoms trapped in electromagnetic fields to create qubits. In fact, uh, trapped ions are very stable and long coherence times, which is, in fact, coming from, again, a superposition principle. The next is neutral atoms. In fact, they are uh, similar to trapped ions, but they are not trapped in electromagnetic fields. Instead, they are held uh, in place by uh, lasers, and they are, of course, controlled by lasers. Of course, we have another uh, <clears throat> platform called as quantum dots. They are small semiconductor particles that can be used to create qubits. 
and they are promising as they can be manufactured using standard semiconductor fabrication techniques. And another uh, photonic hardware platform is photonic uh, hardware. It, it is the photonic quantum computers use photons or particles of light to create physics. Photonic quantum computers are still in the early stage of development, but we can confidently say that they are they uh, they operate in room temperature. For their operation uh, cost is much lower than the uh, rest of the platforms. Okay. Now let's start from uh, the postulates of quantum mechanics. In fact, this is not a quantum mechanics lecture. Uh, as I said, it, it's going to be a brief review about the mathematics of uh, quantum computation based on complex linear algebra. But for motivation in our intu intuition, we would like to post, uh, review the postulates. So the first postulate is about the state of a system state of a quantum system. The state of a quantum system is a vector in a Hilbert space, which is a complex vector space. So the state, which we call psi or other uh, symbol, contains all information that we can obtain about the system. Okay. So the state of a quantum system is a vector in a Hilbert space. So this is an introduction to our mathematics which is known as complex linear algebra. So let's review or start to know something about the essential linear algebra. So the elements of a vector space are vectors and then can be represented by column matrices, okay? So in an n-dimensional complex vector space, a column matrix can be uh, represented by this <clears throat> symbol here, Z1 and Zn are uh, complex uh, numbers, okay? And we denote this vector by alpha cat. So here, this symbol is known as Dirac notation, and we call this as a cat, okay? So we use to represent the quantum system uh, of our interest, okay? So we know that vectors are additive in the same vector space, which means that we can add or subtract uh, these vectors. It is the same thing with adding or subtracting. It, uh, it has the same rules by uh, adding or subtracting the uh, column vectors or column matrices, okay? <clears throat> Here, we would like to extend our information in terms of basis. Let's assume that AI be a set of complex coefficients and alpha I be a set of vectors spanning the same space. The linear combination of these vectors is given by this addition notation, okay? Which means that we can linearly combine or add these uh, vectors, okay? This is nothing, this is not, uh, this is just, uh, Assuming this is just implying that we can comfortably add these vectors if they are in the same vector space. Okay. We have some remarks to remember about uh, linear algebra. First, if no vector in a set can be expressed as a linear combination of the other vectors, then the set is linearly independent. Okay. And if a set of vectors is linearly independent, then the set forms a basis for the vector space spent by those vectors, okay? So we have uh, two important new remarks. One of them is linear independence and the other is basis. So these bases are going to be uh, very important for our quantum computation uh, fundamentals. Another remark, any vector alpha can be expanded over a basis, uh, over a basis set, okay? This means that if you have a single vector, you can write the single vector state as a linear combination of other vectors, but they should be, they should satisfy the basis condition, okay? 
So this uh, simple equation is going to be uh, important for us in the new slides. Okay. And another remark, the number of elements in every basis of uh, the space known as the dimension of the space. Okay. So my dimension, for example, Euclid space that we live in uh, is uh, our uh, three dimensional vector space, but Hilbert spaces do not have that restriction. In fact, uh, in principle, they have infinite dimensions, but in our specific problem, they can be two dimensional, three or more dimensional complex vector spaces. So the limit or the number of dimension is uh, specified by the number of bases in that vector space. We should also talk about linear operators because quantum mechanics is a linear theory. Okay? And our uh, operators should also be linear. So what is a linear operator? Consider an operator A maps each vector alpha in a vector space into another vector in the same vector space, such that beta equals A multiplied by alpha. So this means that if I apply an operator to alpha, I obtain another vector. Okay? This maps alpha into another vector, but in the same vector space. So this is not the uh, definition of linearity. This is just the initial assumption for us. Okay, Beta equals A alpha. But the linearity definition uh, comes here. An operator is linear if for any operators, alpha and beta satisfies this equation. Here we see that if we have a summation here, just like a linear combination, as we said in the previous uh, slide, and if A applies to uh, this uh, <clears throat> summation or linear combination of a vector set, then this, this should be equal that operator A is being applied individual items in the summation. So this is, in fact, one of the uh, principles of linearity, but this is sufficient uh, for us. This is linear if it satisfies this equation. Okay. Here, we have a note. The identity operator is an operator that maps a vector to itself, and it's also a linear operator. Next we should talk about inner products. In fact, if you have some uh, information about uh, vectors, we know what an inner product is. So inner product is a function which takes two vectors, alpha and beta, which is an element of a vector space, as an input and produces a complex number as output. Okay, So we have two vectors, Initially, and if you inner product them, what you obtain is not a vector anymore. It is a complex number. No. Okay. So if we work in terms of, again, the Dirac notation, here we have two vectors, alpha and beta, and our function maps these vectors just like this. So this is the symbol of inner product. And we have obtained a complex number, just a number, not a vector. Okay. Here, <coughs> this dual form of alpha, this reverse alpha, is a vector dual to alpha. Okay. We will talk about this. This dual form is called bra, and the normal cat is uh, called as cat. So this is a bracket notation, we can say. So this is the symbol of inner product. Okay. We have a question as, is the dual form is just like a mirror image? No, it's not like, not like that. So uh, to obtain a mirror image of a vector, we need another operator. Uh, no operator is being applied uh, to, in fact, alpha to make it uh, a bra. It's just <clears throat> a mathematical knowledge. But we will see that, how it is possible. 
Inner products can also be represented by uh, matrix products, okay? Because uh, these uh, vectors have a matrix representations. So if this is a vector initially uh, represented in the uh, first slide, so the bra is in fact represented by its transpose and conjugate form, okay? We have n multiplied by one dimensional uh, column vector and it's a bra in ma uh, matrix form is represented by one multiplied by n. In fact, it's transpose, I mean, but all the complex elements are in the bare complex conjugate form, okay? So, simply, we can say that this dual form, to find the dual form, you take the transpose of the column matrix and you will take the complex conjugate of all the elements. So, this, this is how you obtain the dual form of the, uh, or the bra form of any vector. Therefore, therefore, here, here is our inner product result. If you multiply by means of uh, two vectors, then we will obtain a summation, but simply the summation is again a complex number, okay? So we satisfy this uh, row vector multiplied by this column vector is equal to a complex number. So in a product have uh, some uh, properties. The first one is if you in a product, the same uh, vector by itself, you obtain a positive number, which is known as positivity. And the complex conjugate of uh, the uh, inner product uh, or the inner product by reverse order is equal to its complex conjugate, okay? which is known as Skeeves metric. Next, another important aspect is the norm of a vector, okay? So norm of a vector is in fact defined as the square root of its inner product, okay? So in fact, this is the length of the vector, okay? And a vector is called normalized when it has a unit norm in which if its length is one or unit, then we call this vector as normalized. So in quantum mechanics, the systems should be normalized in order to satisfy the unity conditions or real physical systems. So a vector can be normalized by dividing itself into its norm, okay? So if a vector is not normalized, then you can normalize a vector by dividing it simply its norm. So let's have a quick example about this. Consider two vectors in three-dimensional complex vector space given by A and B. Please normalize A and B, okay? So this uh, uh, solution is straightforward to find. Simply what we should do is find the length of A by taking the square root of the inner product of A. So we can do it by uh, the normal inner product matrix representation. If you multiply them, what you will obtain is a number. Uh, of course, it should be a positive number because of the positivity condition. And so its norm is the square root of this number. So if you want to normalize A, you should divide it by its norm or length. So this is the normalized form matrix representation of A. Likewise, you can do the same thing for B, and here is the normalized form of B. So this is the way how we normalize vectors, okay? So the next uh, important uh, aspects are called orthogonality and orthonormality aspects. Here, two non-zero vectors, alpha and beta, 
are referred to as orthogonal if their inner product is zero, okay? And if a set of vectors is said to be orthonormal, if they satisfy this orthonormality condition, if two different vectors in the set is uh, equal to one, or if these indices are the same, they should be equal to one. If the indices are not the same, they should be equal to zero. So, which is represented by Kronecker delta function, which is a uh, which has a simple property about the IG indices. Okay. So, orthonormality is known as orthogonality and unity uh, properties. Now let's come back to a physical intuition for motivation. Let's talk about a rule about measurements in quantum mechanics, which is known as Born's rule. The probability of measuring a system in a particular state is given by the square of the absolute value of the inner products of the state vector with the corresponding eigenstate being measured. So what does this sentence mean? Let's try to understand. Here, we uh, talk about a vector can be expanded into a linear combination. And in this linear combination, there are some coefficients in front of the vectors. So these coefficients, we will see that represent some probabilities being on that state. If you want to find the probability of a, a specific state, for example, i, alpha i, what you should do is to multiply from the left in dual form and take the absolute square. So what you will obtain is the probability of being that state, okay? So let's try to understand with an example. If we have a vector alpha, and we see that this alpha uh, spans a three-dimensional vector space, Find the probability of this uh, vector being in the second <clears throat> quantum state. Okay. Here <clears throat> we see that uh, in the previous slides we see that summation. Okay. In this summation, the basis vectors are in fact uh, the uh, eigenstates. In fact, the eigenstates of that vector, okay? And uh, we can expand this alpha, we can expand this alpha as a summation of these uh, three matrices, okay? So here, this matrix, okay, this matrix can be written just like this, A1, 1, 0, 0, plus, plus A2, A2, Sorry for my writing. Uh, zero, one, zero, plus A3, A3, multiplied by zero, zero, one. Okay, these are my basis vectors. So this is, in fact, alpha one, this is alpha two, and this is alpha three. Okay, and these are the coefficients and in fact complex coefficients in front of this. So this is a summation. This is this is a summation. In fact, this summation represents this summation. Okay. This is starting from one to n. Here n is three because my dimension is three. My vector space dimension is three. So what I have done is just to expand in terms of summation. Okay. I didn't do something else. Okay. So the problem, my question is, find the probability that the vector is in alpha two. What is the probability of the vector is in alpha two? So we will try to uh, calculate this probability in, by using the Born's rule. So this, this is what are we trying to do, okay? So first let's uh, clear first here before going on. And then let us apply the Born's rule again for the, for the first time. 
here, as we said, we can expand this alpha in terms of uh, the uh, basis is basis. And what we should do is to take uh, or multiply uh, the second eigenstate from the left because this is the state in which it's in which we are seeking to, to find its probability. If you do this uh, multiplication from the left, you should be able to expand this because uh, quantum mechanics is linear and this multiplication can be extended in terms of uh, three basis states uh, by the associativity uh, property. Then if you do that, but we are going to obtain these three items. Here we are going to see that alpha 2 and alpha 1 and alpha 2 and alpha 3 should be orthogonal, which means that they will obtain a zero result. Because remember that we assume that they are they should be a state should be orthonormal, orthonormal. If we are talking about the same state inner product, the result should be one. And if the indices are different, it should obtain a zero result. So what we are going to obtain is only this result. And this item is going to survive after this uh, multiplication, okay? But still we did not find the probability. We have obtained uh, this multiplication and this inner product is A2. But what we want to find is the probability and it should be square root uh, I'm sorry, uh, absolute square of this inner product. And this is uh, A2 uh, absolute square, okay? It could, it could be a number or something else. So you can say that I can directly see this result uh, from the matrix representation. Yes, it's uh, obvious, it's here, A2, but for large uh, matrix multiplications, or if you are writing a code, what you should do is to follow this formula, the Bones rule, okay? Okay, now let's uh, move uh, on, okay? In quantum computation, which uh, basis do we use? We use standard basis. What is uh, the standard basis? In quantum computation, what we use is zero or one, which is an element of two-dimensional complex vector space as standard basis. So you will always see these zeros and ones uh, represented by these column matrices, okay, as standard basis. So these basis states are orthonormal as they should be. Okay. So if we have uh, defined uh, the basis states, orthogonality and orthonormality aspects, now we are ready to define a qubit, a quantum bit in terms of mathematical uh, definitions. A qubit is a vector in a two-dimensional complex vector space. So that's, this is the definition, okay? N no more uh, definition we need uh, initially, okay? It can be defined through any orthonormal basis in two-dimensional complex vector space, but in fact, we adopt standard basis representation of a qubit. So in fact, this is a qubit and this qubit has some other, uh, can uh, have some other representations. In fact, we'll see in the next lecture, block sphere representation, but uh, initially, this is sufficient for us. Here, again, we have uh, some complex coefficients in front of these basis states. And in fact, these coefficients uh, carry the necessary information about the qubit. Okay. Uh, these bases, okay, uh, carry uh, 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 the, the information that these ba basis states carry is based on these coefficients. So these unknown coefficients are important for, uh, are extremely important for us. Here, these complex coefficients should obey the norm, uh, the unity condition. Uh, and of course, uh, their uh, absolute uh, square summation should be equal to one according to the normalization condition. So in uh, quantum computation, <clears throat> uh, we have also 
uh, some different kind of products, which is called uh, outer product. Just like inner product, we have also outer products. So what are they? The product of a cat with a bra, which is written as the static form, is an outer product. Okay, but please uh, be careful when uh, multiplying these uh, matrix representations. Uh, we should uh, understand that inner product always uh, produces a complex number. The result is a complex number, but the outer product is an operator, not a number. Okay. To understand this, let's multiply. If outer product is an operator, it should map a state to another state. So this is an outer product, and if this is an operator, and if you multiply it with a cat, we should be able to write this here. We I see an inner product. So if I write it more accurately here, I see an inner product, but I know that the inner product is a complex number, so I can write this in any order which I can want. Okay, so I can write this in front of this uh, alpha. So the result is C alpha. So what I obtain here, just uh, psi vector is being mapped to the alpha. So this is really uh, an operator. Okay, the outer product is an operator and inner product result is a C number. Okay. The, in quantum computation, the operators have some unique properties. They should be Hermitian and they should be unitary. Uh, what are they? Okay, what are they? What's done Hermitian operator? What's done unitary operator? So Hermitian conjugate of an operator, A, is defined as the complex conjugates and transpose. If we are talking about a matrix representation, complex conjugate of each item and taking the transpose of an operator. So it is just like the taking the dual form of a vector, but we are not talking about vectors here. We are talking about uh, operators because operators are always square represented by square matrices, okay? And by n square matrices. In fact, in quantum computation, uh, they are 2 to the power n multiplied by 2 to the power n because we are talking about the uh, two-dimensional vector spaces, okay? Uh, so the operators are always represented by square matrices. So the, uh, this uh, Hermitian uh, conjugate of an operator is symbolized as this dagger symbol, okay? And it's a, a we, you, you can find the Hermitian conjugate of a square uh, matrix by taking the complex conjugate and taking its transpose. So a, an operator is said to be Hermitian, Hermitian if, if the operator is equal, if the Hermitian conjugate of the operator is equal to itself, okay? So this property is not the definition of uh, an Hermitian operator. This is just how to take the Hermitian conjugate of the operator. But this is the definition of Hermitian operator. An operator is said to be Hermitian if the Hermitian conjugate of that operator is equal to that operator. Okay? So Hermitian operators are of importance for quantum mechanics because uh, <clears throat> The uh, observables in quantum mechanics are defined by operators, and Hermitian operators' uh, eigenvalues are real, and the Hermitian operator eigenvectors are orthogonal. Just like uh, just like the energy operator, the energy is real numbers always. So the uh, energy operator, which is called as Hamiltonian that we will see later, should be an Hermitian operator. So these are some definitions and the properties of the operators that should be satisfied to represent a, the quantum mechanical operator. So let's see some properties of Hermitian adjoint operation, okay? 
For example, if you have alpha multiplied by uh, um, operator A, and if you take the Hermitian conjugate, what is the result? Or if you want to take the Hermitian conjugate of a chat or Hermitian conjugate of Dura, or if you want to take the Hermitian conjugate of multiplication of two operators, what are the results? So these, here are the results. So if you take this uh, Hermitian conjugate, you will obtain the complex conjugate of the complex number multiplied by the Hermitian conjugate of that operator. So Hermitian conjugate of a chat is equal to uh, its uh, dual version, and uh, the bra Hermitian conjugate is equal to the chat. And uh, the, the Hermitian conjugate of the multiplication of two operators is equal to the multiplication of the Hermitian conjugates of the operators, but with the reverse order. So why is the order is reversing? So it's an interesting question, but uh, you, we will understand in the next uh, slides. Here, uh, the following uh, properties satisfies. So this is also a multiplication, and the Hermitian conjugate of this multiplication is uh, bra multiplied by a bigger. And here we see that if you apply a b is multiplication of two operators, which means that B is applying first to the states, and then A is applied to the same state. Okay, and if you take the Hermitian conjugate of this, uh, B also B should be applied B dagger first, and the A dagger should be secondly uh, applied here. Okay. So we see that uh, this uh, order should be satisfied in order to preserve the order of being applied to the uh, to a specific quantum state. So if you if uh, if a, uh, an operator is represented by this outer product, then of course its permission conjugate should also be able to represent it by this outer product, but in the uh, reverse order. And if you apply the Hermitian adjoint operator. Her mission, uh, a joint operator to a summation, and uh, equally, you will obtain the uh, distinct summations of the Hermitian adjoint operators. So these are some operators that you will safely uh, make uh, quantum mechanical calculation. And next, the unitary operator. So unitary operator is extremely important for us. Uh, in all quantum computing operators are permission and also should be unitary. Okay, so what's a unitary operator? An operator is said to be unitary if its adjoint is equal to its inverse. So we can make uh, mathematically this uh, uh, definition, or equivalently, we can write that if u dagger u or u u dagger is equal to identity because this these are the same thing. If you multiply uh, this uh, operation from the right with u, for example, u inverse with u equal to identity, it is nothing. And of course, we should be able to multiply it from the left-hand side. So you, what you obtain with this. So in fact, this implies some different uh, results for uh, unitary operators. But we should say unitary operators are important because they describe the time evolution of a quantum state. And unitary operators also preserves norm. For example, if you have such a vector, for example, a vector multiplied by just like this, and if you apply a unitary operator here, you will obtain another vector just like a reflection or just like a rotation, I don't know. Let's call this vector as phi uh, prime. So as you see, I'm just rotated this vector if I, if I uh, apply a unitary operation, which means that its length is the same. So unitary operators uh, are norm-preserving operators. They preserve norm. And another important result for unitary operators are, uh, we will see in fact this in the next slide, but if you apply a unitary operator to a specific quantum state, 
you will obtain you will obtain this state in a later time. So time is hidden in this unitary operator. We will see its how. And if you apply u dagger, if you apply u dagger to this operator, what you will find to, is to recover the initial state. Okay, we have started from psi, and if we apply this unitary the uh, the <coughs> u dagger to the inverted state, you will obtain the uh, initial state. So. We can safely say that uh, the quantum mechanical or quantum computational uh, states are reversible, okay, as they should be. So, uh, a question is, uh, coming from uh, the chat is asking, is it pseudo inverse? No, this, this is just the uh, Hermitian Hermish, uh, adjoint of this operator, which we have explained now. Okay. Okay. Le let's have an example. The, in our example, Find the matrix representation of A dagger if A is given by this outer product notation. Find the matrix representation of A dagger. Let's first find A dagger uh, in this outer product notation. Okay. We can uh, we know that if A is given by this notation, we can write A dagger. Uh, by reversing these outer product notations. And of course, uh, here minus i should be plus i. Okay. So why is that? Uh, it's coming uh, from the uh, property that I have given in the previous slide. So let's find the, uh, let's find the matrix representation of A dagger. Here we know that one zero outer product the matrix representation of one zero out product can be formed uh, by this uh, matrix multiplication. So uh, we can simply write this. And also we can write zero one out product as in this form. Okay. And then let's just put it into this A bigger uh, expression. If we insert this A, A bigger uh, expression here, this is one zero. Okay. We are writing here, and this one we are writing here, that we will obtain the uh, matrix representation. Okay, this is that uh, simple. Okay, now we are moving some uh, other uh, permission uh, and uh, unitary operators, but <clears throat> Before moving that, we I would like to stop for a while and uh, take some uh, motivational uh, intuition. Uh, before Pauli operators, we would like to revisit a uh, concept of spin. In terms of uh, classical physics, a spin is uh, based on a rotational motion of a rigid body. Just like this rotational motion, we can uh, make a resemblance or we can uh, make an analogy uh, between the electron motion just like this. If an electron is rotating just like here, right-hand side or left-hand side rotation, we can uh, represent the spin-up or spin-down rotation. Of course, electrons never do such rotations in real, but this is, as I said, is just an analogy from classical physics. So, <coughs> Electrons are uh, spin half integer uh, uh, spin particles. But uh, here we can represent them by uh, simple matrices. Uh, spin matrices are uh, represented by Sx, Sy, and Sz uh, spin uh, operators. Here, uh, the matrices that are of our importance is called sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, which are called the Pauli operators or Pauli matrices. So the structure of these matrices, maybe you can memorize, because if you want to deal with 
quantum computation, uh, it's better to memorize them uh, because in physics, in general, physics don't advise to memorize the formulas, but these operators are very simple and it's very useful to memorize them. So these operators are represented by this uh, three uh, matrices, okay? In fact, in fact, uh, if you take the, uh, if you find the eigenvalues of these operators or the eigenvectors of these operators, the sigma z operator, for example, you will find the standard basis, okay? Because uh, this is a diagonal operator. And if you uh, calculate the eigenvectors, you, what you will obtain is uh, to find the standard base. One. Okay, so the standard bases are coming from the eigenvectors of the uh, Pauli Z operator, which can comfortably say. Okay. And uh, the other uh, point is uh, these operators <coughs> are uh, also Hermish and unitary, which means that they are equal, uh, equal uh, to their own conjugate uh, transpose. Uh, we can play with these operators. These Pauli operators can be decomposed uh, in terms of the outer product form in the computational basis. So you can uh, simply write sigma x in this form, sigma y in this form, and sigma z in this form, okay? So uh, in the previous slide, we have already found how to find the outer product matrix representation. And another extremely important operator is the Hadamard operator for us in terms of quantum computation. Hadamard operator is defined uh, with a, uh, in terms of other operators, just like this, and the matrix representation lies in this form. Okay, so the impact of the other mark operator and the effects of other operators are in the following. So if you apply x operator, Paula x operator in the zero standard uh, <clears throat> basis state, what you will obtain a uh, cat one, and if you apply uh, the x Pauli operator to cat one, what you will obtain cat zero. So this looks like uh, x Pauli x operator is just like a not operator in sort of uh, theory of uh, <clears throat> electrons, just like this. So we can also satisfy these relations by uh, making the matrix multiplications, just like this, and you will obtain the uh, results, the necessary results. Okay. And, for example, if you apply the X operator to a qubit, which is a superposition of 0 and 1 states, what you will obtain, because since it has a linear uh, form, you can uh, distribute this X into in front of these bases, and what you will obtain a, a similar state. But if you, uh, if you are careful, you will see that alpha, is now in front of uh, the basis one cat, in front of the basis one cat state, and beta is in front of the cat zero state. So X is related to the not state by analogy, not gate by analogy, if you make, if you want to make uh, a quantum computation, you can see. And in fact, I didn't write here, uh, but if you apply a Hadamard gate to a, a zero uh, cat state, what you will obtain is the following, one over square root zero plus one, okay? So you see that the Hadamard gate uh, introduces a single uh, state cat state into a superposition state. For this reason, this uh, Hadamard gate does not have a classic analogy of, uh, or classical counterpart. Uh, it is purely a quantum operator, okay? So you can uh, try to see uh, by making the matrix multiplication and you can prove it by yourself 
And you can also try to uh, see the effect of the Hadamard gate when you multiply just like this, because the Hadamard gate is one over square root two, one, one, one minus one. And if you apply it to the cat state one, in fact, what you will obtain is the following. This is one over two multiplied by, again, this is a superposition state, but here we have minus in uh, between these cat states, okay? So the effect of Hadamard gate to comp computational basis space uh, is that it creates a superposition state. Okay, now uh, let's proceed with the expectation value of an operator, okay? So expectation value term comes from statistics, in fact, and uh, just like in statistics, uh, we should uh, be able to take some uh, results from many experiments in quantum computation. So the expectation value of an observable represents the average value of one would obtain from repeated measurements of the observable on a system prepared in the same state. Okay. So mathematically, the expectation value of an operator is in the following form. So if you have a quantum state, you should multiply it from the right and from the left uh, as in this form. Okay. So this is how you find the expectation value of an operator, and it is deeply related with measurements. Okay, so in fact, this can be a measurement result. So we call this expectation value of observable A, which is represented by an operator A <clears throat> in uh, PSI basis. Okay. okay, another example, a quantum system, assume that a quantum system is in this state, okay? find the expectation value of Pauli X operator in this PSI basis, okay? So how can we find, how can we solve this question? So directly we can, directly we can apply this formula, okay? Then first we can do it with matrix representation, just the matrix multiplication. We have, what we know is we know X operator, which is Pauli X, and we have this uh, state, and you can represent this state in terms of a column matrix, just like this, okay? So the expectation value of the operator should be in this form. You should multiply X from the right with this form, and you should multiply from the left within the dual form. So this is a row vector, okay? Since this is a row vector, one square root three, multiplied by x and the column matrix. So this is a triple matrix multiplication and you will uh, multiply these matrices in the usual way. And if you multiply them, you will obtain that the result is this, okay? But <clears throat> as the matrices become larger, and if you don't like matrix multiplication, you can uh, calculate this expectation value without using the matrix representation. Or you can uh, calculate by using the Dirac notation. So here again, let's try to calculate the same result by using the Dirac notation. X multiplied by psi, okay? <clears throat> First, let's here, we have an X operator and distribute this X operator into the basis. If you do that, Okay, if you do that, you will obtain. So in the previous uh, slide, we, we know the uh, action, we know the effect of X to zero basis, and we know the effect of X to one basis. So it just inverts, okay? So this is our first result when we apply X to Psi. And then what we should do is to multiply Psi from the left as a dual form, if you want to find this, you will uh, multiply this result <clears throat> from the left. So this is this is x psi, okay? 
and this is psi bra. Okay, if I write it here, this is simply psi. So this is the expectation there. So if you distribute this just like this, zero and just like this, and if you uh, distribute this multiplication by the associated uh, property, what you will obtain is the following. You will just find this result, okay? And uh, from the orthonormality and orthogonality property, you know that this result is one, and this result is also one, and this result from the orthogonality condition will yield zero result, and these two terms will survive, okay? So what we will, what we are going to obtain is going to be the same result as we have found by the matrix multiplication method. Okay, so this is how you can find the expectation value uh, of an operator in a specific basis. We have some more boring mathematical properties that we need to deal. Uh, this is called commutator algebra. Okay, so what? does commutation mean in quantum mechanics? Because in quantum mechanics, if, uh, if you go right and then turn left, or if you go left and turn right, these are not the same thing, okay? That's why the operators are represented by matrices, because the matrices do not have commutation properties. If you multiply the matrices in reverse order, the results are not going to be the same. So in general, quantum mechanics are not commutative. So what does commutation mean? Commutator of two observables A and B is expressed as AB minus BA. So if uh, the uh, order is not important, so the result should be zero, okay? But in general, not always, in general, these results are not equal to zero uh, in quantum mechanics, okay? If this result is zero, we say that A and B commute. Then this means that these two observables are, or these two events are independent, okay? When two quantum observables commute, the meaning their corresponding operators share the same eigenstates, they can be measured simultaneously with arbitrary precision without affecting each other. So this is the uh, definition of commutativity formula. So the uh, properties of the commutation is commuta uh, commutator is an anti-symmetric, meaning that AB is equal to minus PA. Uh, so this is a symbol of the commutation. Uh, commutation is linear. If you have just like this commutation, it can be written in this form, <clears throat> or if you have this multiplication form, it can be written in this form. Here, you should write C in the right, and you should write B in the left. So these orders are important for us, OK? OK, and let's uh, talk about the Pauli operators and the commutation relations, because, uh, in fact, we are only uh, dealing with these commutation relations for Pauli operators. So they satisfy the following cyclic relations. So sigma x, sigma y is a commutation is equal to 2i sigma z. And if you change the order in this uh, counter uh, clock rotation, uh, you will find these uh, commutation relations that you can uh, prove yourself by multiplication. Okay, now we will uh, conclude this uh, lecture uh, by uh, after uh, introducing a slight after a slight introduction to quantum algorithms uh, but uh, of course we are still uh, in the level of one qubit state and uh, after some boring mathematical explanations now we are uh, let's uh, try some quantum algorithm and operators so <clears throat> in quantum algorithms uh, a single line represents a qubit, and double lines represent classical bits. And this line with n, with n slot, represents multiple qubits, n qubits. 
uh, this symbol represents a measurement. We will see how a measurement can be obtained in the next lecture. And this U is an operator acting on a single qubit, because here you see U box is on uh, a single qubit, is uh, on the single qubit line. And this U uh, operator is acting on multiple qubits. Okay, so these are just the symbols when you look at a quantum algorithm, you should understand what's happening. So we are still now in the level of a single qubit operations. We know that Pauli X, Pauli Y, Pauli Z, and Hadamard gates, and we have some, a few more uh, single qubit operations. These are single qubit gates. In fact, we are going to call them as logic gates because we will do logical operations. So the matrix representations of each one and the uh, effects of these operators uh, to the initial states is in the following. We know that it's mapping, how the X gate is mapping zero cat state to one and one to zero. And the effect of Y to zero is I one and effect of power gate to one, the uh, cat state is minus I zero and so on here. Uh, also, the effect of Hadamard gate to zero cat state and to one state is in the following form. So, uh, before completing, let's uh, program a single qubit quantum computer. Let's try to find out if we have. So, this is in fact a quantum algorithm, the simplest possible quantum algorithm, maybe. Uh, you see an initial state. Your quantum state or your one qubit quantum computer starts from uh, zero cat state, and you have uh, two successive uh, Hadamard gates operated. So, what is the final result? So, this is our question. And the next question if these operators is being acted on this initial state, what is the final state? So, this is the second question. So in fact, you should be able to answer the first question immediately. Why? Because here we know that we know that uh, the Hadamard operation, just like the other operators, are permission. Therefore, it is equal to its uh, permission um, conjugate, and then uh, we can simply uh, write that. Here in uh, quantum algorithms, time flows from left to right here, which means that this operator is being acted here. So we should uh, represent uh, this uh, operator just like here, okay? And this operator then is being acted to this state. But here we can say that h is equal to h dagger, Therefore, which is also equal to this. And we know that this multiplication is equal to identity. Why? Because this is a unitarity condition, which means that we should recover this. Uh, the final state is, in fact, the same with the initial state. So there is no effect with these successful algorithms. Okay? But if you multiply with a third Hadamard gate, so what you will obtain is the effect of just single Hadamard. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is that simple. But if you want to make the uh, <clears throat> mathematical operation precisely, okay, what you should <clears throat> do is the following. Or if you don't believe this, we can use the following operations. Okay, let's first act the single Hadamard gate to zero cat state. And what we will obtain is this superposition state. And then we will again apply the Hadamard gate now to this state. Okay? If I apply this Hadamard gate to this state, I know that this Hadamard gate, because of the linearity condition, should be acted in front of all the bases. <clears throat> and the action of this Hadamard gate is again a new superposition state, should yield a new superposition state. And of course, this 
uh, action of Hadamard K to one cat state should yield another superposition state, but this time with a negative sign in front of the basis, and this should be the positive sign in front of the basis. So if you put the one over uh, one divided by square root two in front of the uh, global parenthesis, what you will <clears throat> find, what you will find is the following. Okay, so here you will see that these bases are going to vanish because of the destructive interference, and what you will obtain is going to be a zero cat state, which will recover the initial state. Okay. So acting the uh, unitary operators in uh, even uh, times, you will obtain you will obtain the initial state. But of course, this is uh, valid in theory. Uh, if you apply this quantum gates in IBM quantum computer in a real quantum computer, you will see that you will not be able to obtain this initial state. There are going to be some very slight differences coming from the noise. This is a whole other story, okay? And next, and the final question is the final question. We have this uh, gate. So again, time flows from uh, left to right. And in fact, the, um, the operator, multi operator representation of this quantum circuit, so this is a quantum circuit, and is in the following, uh, which operator, is being acted first to this uh, state X. So you should write X and then H and then Z and then Z. I'm sorry, this is too ugly. This is Z and this is zero. So this is the operator representation of this circuit. As you see, time flows from left to right, but uh, the order that you act the operators to the state is from right to left, okay? And then if we apply these things, uh, what we expect is cat1, and if you apply cat1, the Hadamard gate, what you will obtain the superposition state, and if you apply the Z gate to, uh, to this, what you will obtain, the Z gate does not affect the zero cat state, but it inverts the one into minus one, so this minus will cancel. So what you we will obtain is just a square position state. Okay. Okay. Uh, in this lecture, we have made a small review, uh, some maybe uh, boring mathematical uh, properties, but now we leave uh, with a single uh, qubit uh, operation, and uh, if you have. Uh, questions, then I can answer. So a question uh, in the previous slide, we have one answer, uh, question. Uh, the question is, why did you multiply parentheses by one over square root in the previous slide? The reason why we do that is coming from the uh, Hadamard gate. So uh, as you know, the matrix multiplication of the Hadamard gate was just like this. Okay. It, it's coming from the Hadamard gate. One over square root, one, one, one minus one. Okay. So this is the reason why we multiply it. So if you act, if you act this to zero cat state, what you will obtain is simply this one. So uh, the one over square root is coming from the Hadamard operation. Okay. And if you apply it two times, it will come. That's the way. So another question, <clears throat> what should be the intuition for the gates other than X? In which cases, uh, when uh, we should use them? In fact, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, in, in fact, these gates, uh, in fact, these gates, uh, initially, you should learn the action of them. And in the uh, following 
or the advanced versions of quantum computation, you will see that the operators can be split into many gates. And after that, uh, the composition uh, into elementary gates in which compose of X, Y, and Z, uh, you will obtain smaller gates. And these smaller gates will be composed of single and two qubit gates. So you should know the action of them. So you don't need an intuition or motivation to understand all the operations to use because they will be small parts of a bigger operation. Maybe one more question. Uh, will you be sharing the slides and do you recommend any extra materials about the lecture that we can go over? Okay, uh, let me... Uh, share you the uh, some materials in the end of the second lecture uh, and uh, this is also being uh, recorded but uh, if they don't mind i can also send the slides because it's a public presentation and maybe uh, the organizers can help you about how they share these slides and i can give you at yes. the end of uh, it will be great. We can share uh, in our uh, in the co events website. And uh, so, are we going to take a coffee break, and, or do you want? No, to... this is the end uh, of today's uh, lecture, uh, and we will uh, continue in the uh, next lecture in the fourteenth September. Okay, guys, see you later, okay? Okay, uh, uh, so if uh, the participants have any questions, they can write it on the Q&A box. Uh, so the lecture uh, is over, right? <laughs> yes, yes, the lecture is over. Okay. The first part uh, is over, thank okay? You. <laughs> NCC Turkey, thank you, Deniz okay. Ocan, for okay. the great talk and valuable contribution to the training. Uh, and also, I would like to thank all attendees for their active uh, participation as well. So I guess we can end the training now. Uh, I, I think see you on Thursday, right? Yes, Thursday. Okay, bye. Have a nice bye. day.